Hello, I'm Anna Nichols. I'm the Director of Communication at Altair Advisors, and welcome to today's program on donor advised funds as a tool for giving. Um, as a point of definition, a donor advised fund or a DAF is like an investment account that's used for charitable giving. And these accounts um, are offered through some large financial organizations such as uh, Schwab and Fidelity, um, as well as some community foundations and some groups such as the American Endowment Foundation. Um, and DAFs have the advantage of allowing a donor to manage giving with sort of less of the overhead and the administration that can come from owning and operating a foundation. And we find we've gotten more and more questions about them over the last few years, and they're something that uh, we help our clients with. And I'm excited today to welcome our guest speaker, John LaFleur, to our program to bring his expertise to you, uh, because this is something that is right in his area. Um, John is a managing director at Strategic Philanthropy, an independent philanthropic consultant to families and individual donors. Um, and John comes to this work with more than 21 years of experience working in a large family office and heading up their private foundation. He's also active on the board of several nonprofits. And so he really understands uh, this giving from both the perspective of the grantor as, where, as well as the grant recipient. Um, and we've invited John to be with us today because we receive, again, a lot of questions about donor advised funds. And John has been, you know, someone that we often turn to uh, for his expertise in this area. So a big welcome and thanks to you, John, for coming to talk with us today. Absolutely. Um, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity, Anna, and um, as well as our, our partnership over the years. Yeah, well, it's uh, good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, same here, same here. I'm going to actually take us out of this format to get us off the slide so our, our viewers can see you a little a little bit better. So bear with me for a second. Okay, now having done that. All right, let me start off by asking, um, you know, we're here again today to talk about donor advised funds. But before we even sort of dive into that, I kind of wanted to ask you, when you sit down to work and consult with a new client and they want to think about things like vehicles, before they get into that, what are the starting points that you want them to be at? What are the things you'd like to talk with them first and foremost about? Um, okay, so you really touched on it. So the first, the first part is really having preliminary planning conversations. And we're always happy to be part of those conversations. Um, so as folks are trying to figure out what the right vehicle might be for them, whether it's a private foundation, a donor advised fund, a charitable trust, or some others. But a lot of that is going to be driven by their uh, wealth and tax advisors. And so before they start thinking about um, these decisions, because what's one of the important things to talk about is that these funds are irrevocable. So once you put the money into a donor advised fund, it's it's it that this is the amount of philanthropic capital that you're setting aside that is no longer yours. So you're taking the first step to donate it to a charitable entity like Schwab Charitable, Fidelity Charitable, American Endowment Foundation, or or, or maybe your local community foundation. Okay. But but the important thing to to keep in mind is that you're you're letting it go. Uh, you can't get it back yes. once you put it in. And um, so it's important to have an upfront conversation with your 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 wealth, your tax advisors, and um, we we we're happy to do complimentary conversations with us too, um, just to help make sure that you're picking the right one, and you're thinking through what some of the um, you know what what the impact is going to be once you make this contribution to one of these funds. Okay, that makes sense. And how should people think about the vehicle for giving that's going to work best for them? Um, you know, what are the aspects that you want them to consider in that decision? Um, mm -hmm. I know you, we talked on the phone some about some of the purpose and flexibility, all those kind of things, but just wanted to hear um, what mm -hmm. your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. So you can accomplish, generally, you can accomplish most of the same things, whether you have a private foundation, a charitable trust, or a donor advised fund. So really it gets into the details of, um, you know, are there going to be exceptions? You know, the donor advice fund is always going to be the easiest for the most part, mm -hmm. um, unless you've got some exceptions for things that you're looking to do as part of your charitable giving plan. So, for example, um, if you're looking to employ a staff, you can't do that through a donor advice fund. Some people um, 
some people are looking to um, start a foundation where they bring their family members in. Some of them are getting paid part time or they have uh, they, they would like to have a foundation that has a, you know, a paid expert on staff. Um, you can't do that with um, with a donor advised fund. You can retain consultants like us and pay for that through your DAF, but you won't be able to offer an employment opportunity. So so that's 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 you know one of the exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking to do really heavy duty philanthropy, where you're where you're doing things like um, uh, what's called program related investments, where you're making loans to nonprofits and or you're um, you're actually buying them a building. Um, you know, that's going to be something that's not going to be able to be done through a donor advised fund either. And that's one of the reasons why people set up uh, private foundations. Mm -hmm. And then we, just one other quick example is if you need, if you were thinking of making grants to individuals for fellowships or for mm -hmm. um, those that are victims of disaster relief and you want to do some direct giving, if you pre-qualify through the IRS, you can do that, but but not through through uh, through DAFs. So it's really a matter of just understanding upfront how you might like to give this money away, and planning for it. Um, and if you have some reservations that you're going to want more flexibility, you might start out in a private foundation, which you can always close. We see this happen a lot. Hmm. People start private foundations and they close them out into, into donor advised funds. Um, hmm. It's going to be, it's going to be um, really a matter of, of what you, how you plan to do your philanthropy, but things like, you know, like legacy uh, and operating, you know, with, uh, with degrees of, of privacy you know, these are some other considerations that you have to think about. Um, you can do certainly execute your legacy through a DAF, but if you're looking to stay private, um, a DAF is absolutely going to be your best, you know, your best option as opposed to a foundation, which, you know, which is going to be out there. Um, your, your tax return will be out there and be public for people to see. So DAF's actually more private in some ways. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. they offer it. And that's, okay. that's one of the reasons... Um, and then you also need to think about how you're going to fund your your charitable vehicle. Um, the um, and this is why it's important to have these upfront conversations with advisors. Mm -hmm. um, depending on whether you're funding with you know things like appreciated stock or art or real estate, um, those are going to get probably better tax treatment if you're putting right. them into a donor advised fund because that's a public charity than if you're putting them into your private foundation. Okay. Okay. Um, kind of based on, and this is a similar question what we just talked about, but when would you advise someone to have a DAF as the best vehicle? You know, can you, or I'm just trying to think, can you share an example of when you mm -hmm. would say, you sure. know what, in this case, I think sure. a DAF would actually make a lot mm -hmm. of sense. So, so touching back on what I just said, we have one, uh, one client couple right now who's sitting on, you know, a lot of appreciated stock, like um, uh, that they've had in the family for years. They come from a Fortune 500 com uh, company. And they're not going to want to sell that. You know, they're looking to to dispose of it, um, but they're not looking to do it all at once. That wouldn't be beneficial for the um, for them for the for the uh, the charities they want to support. So, uh, in this particular case, uh, given that their plans are still just getting started, they're looking to focus on um, affordable housing and the arts in Wisconsin. Um, they're, and they're giving away about a half a million dollars a year. So they're selling their stock off over time and the donor advised fund is offering them preferential treatment, um, over what they could get if they were to put it into a private foundation. They've certainly got enough stock to start one. And that's one of the things that maybe we should just touch on is we typically recommend if your charitable assets are going to be below $10 million, that you should really look at a DAF. Now they're okay. giving away half a million dollars a year. Um, they've got about $3 million in their donor advised fund account, but they're sitting on well over a hundred million dollars worth of stock and they're going to be, you know, getting rid of it over their lifetime. But that's a great example of where they've got enough money to start a private foundation, but there's really no need to, because it's just the two of them. They're not planning on any succession planning. They're planning to do, you know, lifetime giving. So, um, liquidating their their assets through their DAF is really the best move for them. Yeah, a little more simplistic approach. And mm -hmm. with the DAF too, I think this might come up again later, but with the DAF too, you're not required to do that 5% a year of giving, correct? 
That's that is correct. You don't have to, um, you know, there's, 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 there's pros and cons to that. Um, you mm -hmm. don't, so, I mean, and typically most apps to their credit, um, you know, are paying out more than, um, you know, some, some as high as like, you know, in the, in the teens or up to 20%. So you could give more, right. But you don't. So have you can, to you can always give more. Okay. Um, but, but the, but you know, that ends up being a, an aggregate of everybody who has a DAF. There are those people who, um, start the DAF and then they just don't get around to it because they're off to their next company or they're off to their next yeah. adventure. And, right. you know, they, they're doing it for tax purposes, but um, there is the relief of not having that obligation of paying out the five, uh, the five percent annually by working with a donor advised fund. And a lot right. of, a lot of donors um, really want that flexibility. Yeah, I understand. Um, what are circumstances you said just a second ago, you know, if you're if you're sort of in the $10 million a year and sort of giving mark, you, know, you might want to consider a foundation. Now, of course, a foundation, it's a you're then owning sort of a, a, a legal entity. I mean, you're owning a business in some ways at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, what are other circumstances where you would say, eh, you know, and you talk, touched on that a bit, but where a foundation actually might make better sense than adapt? Like the reverse of the question I just asked. Sure. Yeah. So again, going back to um, how how uh, aggressively and involved you want your philanthropy to be, um, if you're looking to um, you know do things that are much more complicated or not simply not allowed by a donor mm -hmm. advised fund, um, you're going to want to go with a with a foundation. But then you're going to you know it, it is. To your, which I think is a good way to put it, even though it's not technically a business, you need to run it with the same um, discipline and um, reporting requirements that you know a business has. A, a foundation is going to pay excise taxes, has to file a tax return, it has to meet you know annually, take minutes, it has to register officers. Um, there's uh, you know a fair amount of governance and then structure uh, you know that you're going to want to implement in doing your foundation yep. that um, is just simply required uh, at, you know yep. under the private foundation rules um, and you just have to be ready for that. Um, so we do work with um, you know we work with families on both. Uh, most of the families that we work with frankly even have both. you know a lot of them mm -hmm. have the sidecar DAF for for other reasons that we'll get to. Um, okay. in, in, in the next questions, but, um, you know, and going back to the earlier discussion, one of them is privacy. Um, if you start a foundation, you say, this is what we're all about. A lot of times you'll have other gifts that you want to make that you don't want to confuse people who follow your foundation by making, you know, sort of off mission gifts and you'll get requests from family or you'll have things that you, you want to support that don't really align with you, the overall mission of your foundation. And it's just simply easier to, you know, make those donations through a donor advised fund. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when people, when you, people come to you and they want to evaluate the different sort of sponsor, I don't call it sponsor options they have for DAF, meaning where they want to open their DAF, like what mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. or what uh, entity mm -hmm. they want to open it with. Um, how do you help them think about like, okay, here's the advantages of sort of the large company approach mm -hmm. with Fidelity or Schwab, or here's what you should mm -hmm. think about if it's, you know, a mm -hmm. community uh, foundation. How do you help people sort of evaluate the choices that they have if they mm -hmm. decide, yes, I, I want to go with the DAF? Okay. So sort of two different answers. So um, okay. as a philanthropic advisor, um, we don't give tax legal or investment advice. And the selection of the donor of the uh, donor advised fund provider is really one that should be um, uh, discussed thoroughly with uh, your investment advisor. So, so for example, mm -hmm. somebody at Altair yep. um, is going to be the best person to provide that to have that discussion with, uh, okay. with regards to who it is, with regards to whether you go to a large foundation or a community fund. I mean, a large donor advised. Uh, DAF provider like Fidelity Schwab or AEF or a community foundation, that's something that we're, you know, we're happy to sort of talk through the, some of the pros and cons with. Uh, typically with community foundations, you know, um, the information that you can get and the educational opportunities that you can get um, are going to be, you know, focused on the community that they operate in. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit more um, geographic centric. Um, sure. You can certainly 
sign up with the Community Foundation and still listen in on learning opportunities from any of the major DAFs. Um, but overall, I would say, you know, and folks coming to us are typically working with someone like yourself. So, mm-hmm. so Altair's team of wealth managers are going to have some thoughts as to where they're best going to be um, able to manage the philanthropic capital on an ongoing basis for your clients. Um, once it goes into the community foundation, you sort of give up that control. So that's something to, to consider. Um, whereas with Fidelity, as long as you're putting in over, like, I believe it's $250,000, um, you know, Altair can continue to manage the money um, as, as they have um, prior to making the donation to the DAF. Yeah, yeah, we actually do get that question fairly often, um, or more often, I should say, uh, by, mm-hmm. you know, should I be using my community foundation? I think sort of our thought about it, too, is mm-hmm. if you're don't, if you're a uh, grant, if you want to do grants and, and your donations are really local, you know, if your mm-hmm. giving is really locally mm-hmm. focused, then, you know, it mm-hmm. can be a good idea. And some of the large community foundations are now allowing um, us to continue to serve as the investment advisor. And they have, you mm-hmm. know, I don't remember what the minimum would be. They have a minimum, you know, just like Bill and Schwab do. And I think it might be a little higher for some community foundations, mm-hmm. not, you know, positive. But for the larger sort of cities, the larger community foundations, some of them are a little more, are a little more. Specific. Sure, sure. And that that's really, that's really so that they remain competitive with, with Fidelity and Schwab. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the next question I wanted to ask you, and I just, sorry, I elbowed my keyboard here a little bit, but I wanted sure. to ask about transferring DAFs in a family. Because I know, you know, if you think about families with a foundation, a lot of times it's sort of, you know, how do we want to talk about this with the next generation? And this is something our mm-hmm. family does. And it's it's this kind of thing that brings people together, you know, on around mm-hmm. giving, you know, is, can you do the same sort of thing with DAFs? You know, what, what do people need to know about even naming a beneficiary? I'm not sure people are sort of aware of that you know, but um, how do you pass down philanthropic values through a DAF? Mm-hmm. Similar in the same way. Sure. So, I mean, when you're setting up your DAF, you're given the option to name a successor. And that is one of the things that you want to make sure you you don't leave blank. You can always go back and change it later um, and amend it. But you don't want to, you know, it's it's like not filling out your will as to who you want to leave leave something to so mm-hmm. if you don't fill out a successor the 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 money um it doesn't get lost it just goes into the the, the general fund that either someone like schwab or fidelity mm-hmm. um you know will make and they will decide you know where your where your your uh your remaining death funds are going right. um so what's you know what one of the things that we've um you know that we end up working on sometimes because we can work as a you know, a, 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 a consultant for folks with DAFs, uh, for all of these DAFs that we've been talking about, is that um, people have been named, um, but then they've never had a conversation with the people that they name. So we've had some, you know, we've had oh. like, for example, you know, someone who named his sister and his nephews because he didn't have any children, didn't have a spouse, um, and left them in charge of, uh, you know, uh, his his donor advisement when he passed, and um, th- they're happy to do it, but they didn't really have yeah. a good Surprise. understanding of what <laughs> what he wanted to support. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, in that particular case, he left it to them, left them to be charitable. And then uh, we had another situation where it was a you know a, probably a twelve million dollar account that um, a woman passed away and left to her two nieces and nephews, and never had a conversation with about him at all. It was something that came out you know, in the settling of the estate. And um, again, we're happy to step in and sort of, um, you know, decipher maybe a little bit about what would be a nice legacy. Yeah. But um, what's easiest, and, and, and particularly with the flexibility around um, when the payouts are, that you're not driven by that 1231 foundation payout, is to simply figure out when when's a good time to have a conversation uh, with your, your your child, your sibling, your spouse, whoever you want to, you're, you're planning to name, or even if it's if it's friends, um, whoever you're planning to appoint as your successor, uh, you know, give them some budget, give them some parameters, have a discussion around what it is, why it is you you decided to commit this money again, which is irrevocable and not coming back to you, but why you decided to commit it to being used for charitable intent. 
what you hope to accomplish with it, what your, what your purpose was for, for leaving it um, to go out there in the world. And um, maybe give them a, a portion to decide, give them uh, you know, an allocation and say, look, why don't you come back to me with a proposal for giving away $5,000, do some research, tell me what's important to you and how you might um, take advantage of this opportunity and um, just get started on it really is, is it's, it's sort of that simple in terms of the, um, you know, of, of passing down your, your philanthropic values. You certainly um, you may ask yeah. them to continue doing what you're doing um, yeah. in your lifetime to some yeah. extent, but also if you're going to ask them to do that, give, give them some flexibility to do what's important to them too. Right. So they stay motivated. Yeah. Don't tie people's hands too much. And so if yeah. you're family giving and say you want to start teaching your children about sort of philanthropic values, or you want to use it as a way of sort of, or a tool, I guess, within teaching mm -hmm. those kind of values, you can just have one DAF. You don't necessarily need to break things out. Correct. Um, yep. You could just use the one and have have allocations around. Sure, okay. sure, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you just have formatting yeah, wise, just, it can be simple in a lot of ways. Exactly. I mean, most of the donation requests are done online. It's really up to you to just um, to really organize your family uh, to the point where, and, and we see a lot of our clients do this. Um, you know, they get together uh, at some good ho holiday that's good for them. And say, you know, um, here's what we here's what we're hoping to hear by for, you know, by this date. We'd like to hear hear you come back and make a presentation to us. And we have kids who are like, you know, nine, ten years old making yeah. presentations to their to their parents or their grandparents, right? So this is a great op great yeah. exercise for grandparents, right? Yeah. It's a really good way to um to bond with your kids because you know typically. You, you know, children are going to have, you know, something in their community that they care about, whether it's sure. where they take art classes yeah. or where they, you know, where the, um, you know, the local animal shelter is, or even, even their, uh, you know, their local library. Yeah. You know? They've looked and, around, they have sort of their yeah. thoughts and opinions on things. Yeah. It's great to sort of be able to encourage that kind of giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, John, I know that, uh, so say if I'm, if I have a DAP at Fidelity or Schwab, I know I can, um, I can, you know, that, that I can work with strategic philanthropy, that you guys offer services through them, mm -hmm. even people can kind of come to you um, to get mm -hmm. help. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and what are the types of things that you do? And just, you know, when does it mm -hmm. make sense to get an expert like you involved when you tend to come into those? Sure, sure. Well, you know, we work with people wherever they are. So, um, uh, you know, if you're just getting started, uh, like I alluded to in the earlier conversations where, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the situation where the, the woman had left the money to her uh, nieces and nephews, but hadn't left any sort of like mission or direction okay. in terms of how she wanted it used. Um, that's, that's an actual case of where we came in, sat down with the family, um, learned about the aunt. Um, and then, you know, they're living in three different locations, which is not uncommon. So, um, you know, we help them sort of figure out what they're out, where, where they wanted to have an impact with their giving, um, did what's called the landscape analysis for each of them. So they understood um, the issue areas better of, of what it is they wanted to support. So if they wanted to support um, homelessness in their city. Um, you know, we did what's called a landscape analysis to sort of out, do some research and outline the providers that are making an impact in, um, you know, in different uh, in different places. Yeah. So uh, the way that it works is, um, you know, we'll get to, you, you can reach out to us, uh, tell us that you have a donor advised fund. We'll figure out the scope of work. Um, and then um, we're set up as a, a vendor, basically, at Fidelity or Schwab or AEF. And we submit a proposal to them saying, you know, here's your here's your client, here's your uh, donor advice fund holder, um, here's the light, the work that we'd like to do with them, and um, you know, and they can actually pay for our services through the donor advice fund. I mean, oh, there's different great. parameters, yeah. there's different parameters and different okay. limitations on an annual basis, um, and it has to be um, you know tied to the grant making that they're making from the DAF. Um, yeah, but right. we do all that work. We'll we'll do all that um, coordination with your uh, with your DAF provider, and um, you know, so some people come to us when they're starting out, 
and then they take it and run with it. Some people uh, have been up and running and they're doing what I think is commonly referred to as the peanut butter giving. So they're giving, you know, a lot of grants, smaller grants to everything and they don't feel like it's very focused. We help people, uh, you know, focus um, and refine their giving. And then we also work with the rising generation, right? So bringing in, um, sometimes you want somebody just to coordinate those um, conversations with the people that are going to be your successors. And sometimes it's easier to bring in an independent voice like ours to, to get that sure. started. Yeah. Third party sometimes I think can go a long way to sort of yeah. having those conversations. It can be a little bit harder yeah. to otherwise have, you know, so that, that's sure. that's sure. thing. So, wow, that, that's sure. a lot. I mean, that, that's And great. tell that's stories, great. right? We, we have, we, like I get, you know. Comparison. We, yeah, you know, people like to hear stories of like what other people are doing, um, particularly things that, you know, you can learn from that woman who didn't have the conversation, right? Right. Like, like yeah. she should have, she yeah. should have told them right. the money was coming and maybe it would have been, um, it's just, it, there's, there's not the same, um, I think there's a, always a deep appreciation from people who are given that opportunity, but I think they, they you know, there's always a longing to say, I wish we'd establish a connection so that I was sure that we're doing what she wanted. And right. it's really, it's really, if you can avoid missing that opportunity, um, based on, you know, having done this with a lot of different families, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. The woman too, that left it without, you know, saying a lot of things. You always say there's money and surprises rarely go well together. <laughs> they're just too yeah, yeah, you know they should yeah. always have some conversation and communication uh -huh. around them and it's always going to go better so um yeah mm -hmm. that's interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um well we know you know i talked a little bit about um, clients using philanthropic tools teaching the next generation um you know is there sort of anything else you know you want to bring about i think we've, we've talked about sort of a lot of the things uh you and i discussed in planning this mm -hmm. call but is there you know anything else you want to leave sort of parting words or things you'd like people to you know, take away when they think about, you know, using a DAP and how to think about that mm -hmm. as a vehicle mm -hmm. before we end. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I think a, a lot of it really can be summed up by, um, you know, having a conversation and doing it like very intentionally. I, we still run into clients who, um, you know, they may work with someone like Altair, but Altair doesn't know their whole picture. Right. And then nobody knows their mm -hmm. whole picture. So oh, it's so important, good, right, right? To understand right. like yeah. what your whole financial okay. picture is. So if you can have a conversation with one advisor uh, to sort of pull together your your whole picture, it makes it a lot easier to um, have that conversation with those that are going to be, you know, uh, coming up to take over your philanthropy. Because we're talking about like for the educational purposes of, of educating like the rising gen and or your successors, um, having a conversation with with everybody that's involved, uh, communication is just really really key because it's going to help you reach sort of the impact because you're making a decision to let go of this money, let go of this wealth. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe it's not all money, maybe it's you know it's other assets, but you're going to commit a purpose, you know, like a like a a, a portion of your life to a purpose. And, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of folks that can, that can help you out if you just open up the lines to communication and yeah. do some planning. And as I said, some of these exercises with the next, uh, the next generation of family members, um, or, or just folks that you plan to involve in your donor advised fund, um, are just really important. And if you can't, um, manage them on your own, um, we're always happy to have a conversation about how we might be able to help. That's great. Yeah. And I love ending on that note of sort of integration of, of wealth issues, because that's something we're really big on. Please don't work in things in silos, because we all need to know yes, you know, what, the, yes, what your yes, entire yes, team yes. is doing, which includes yes, the giving, yes, includes yes. Your state planning, includes us in the current wealth planning and the tax planning. But yeah, it's it's dangerous to have it all too separated because yeah, you, know, you, you yeah. want to you'll have you you'll yeah. get better advice when people understand your full picture. So you want your advice. Sure. Sure. We just had somebody say, I just, you know, I just, we, and it, this wasn't our involvement per se, but somebody said, you know, we just sold the family farm. I need some tax losses. It's the last week of the year and yeah. there weren't any to be had. And, you know, with some other planning, knowing full well that these proceeds were going to charity, 
Um, you know, if we had if we had talked with them or the advisor had been able to talk with them who didn't know that there was a family farm. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, could it, you know, done. It, it could have been done Option, and a lot more. more yeah, a lot more money uh, that went to capital gains taxes could have gone oh. to uh, do some charitable charitable giving. Right. So right. just talk yeah. to people. Just yeah, have a conversation. Yeah. Again, anything sort of yeah, surprises or missing, you know, can sometimes lead to missed opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. Well, thanks so much, John, for being here with us today. We appreciate your taking the time to do that. And yeah. we welcome client to. conversations on uh, yeah. donor advice funds. Yeah. Uh, we can make an introduction to John. Yeah. We can, you know, we do a lot of help with that directly at all there. Yeah. So yeah. we appreciate everybody listening today and um, hope this has been a helpful conversation. So thank you.